Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Among the many life insurance plans offered by our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society, one is of particular interest to homeowners. This plan combines a money-saving mortgage with life insurance security, all in one package. For further information on this Equitable Society Assured Home Ownership Plan, listen carefully to the middle commercial in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Fugitive Traveler. There are more than 5,000 crimes committed in the United States every day. When you pause to think about that fact, your mind conjures up the dark streets of a big city late at night. But the experience of your FBI in dealing with crimes in every one of the 48 states is that crimes don't happen because of geography, but because of people. Crimes are being committed tonight in crowded tenement slums and in peaceful moonlit valleys because there is a criminal president in each case. It is true that there are more crimes committed in big cities, but no section of the nation is so remote that it remains isolated from the crime wave. Tonight's FBI file opens in a farmhouse located in a hilly section of one of our eastern states. It is early evening. A young girl is seated alone on the back steps of this hillside dwelling. In a valley below, a passenger train moves swiftly through the dusk. The girl watches the train, her eyes follow it intently. Len! Len! What? Oh. What is it, Aunt Bessie? I've been calling you for the last five minutes. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Did you bring in some wood? Yes, ma'am. Did you feed the chickens? Yes. Did you bring in the eggs? I, I think I did. Well, where are they? Uh, didn't I put them on the kitchen table? No. Oh, I, I must have left them in the barn. In the barn? Why? I just forgot them, I guess. Well, go get them. Oh, Aunt Bessie, please, not right now. Just let me wait till the train goes around the hill. Oh, good heavens, child. When will you stop this foolish nonsense? Mooning over trains, mooning over books, mooning over going to far-off places. I'll get the eggs. If you'd just give a little more thought once in a while to the fact that I'm an old woman trying to run this farm all by myself, and at least that a strong young girl like yourself... I'm do... getting them, Aunt Bessie. Well, try and remember to bring them right back in the house. We still have to do the dishes and the icebox need cleaning. I know. Thanks. Miss 
Mister. <clears throat> Mister. <laughs> Who are you? Who are you? Never mind. <laughs> Look at your arm. It's bleeding. <laughs> yeah. Let me go in the house. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. oh. Who else is in that house? My aunt. Is that all? Yes, just the two of us. How did you get here? Where, where did you come from? I fell off a train, a freight train. Oh. That's how you were hurt? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I see. Look, I just want to rest a while, and I'll get out of here. But you're bleeding so you need a doctor. I'll find my own doctor. Did you come from far away? What's that to you? I just wondered. Man! <gasps> Man! Who is it? My aunt, I've got to go. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Do me a favor, a big favor. Don't, don't tell her I'm here. Why? Just do me that favor, please. All right. I'll come back later. Some 50 miles away from the lonely farmhouse in a nearby city at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is approaching the desk of the agent in charge. You wanted to see me, Mr. Henderson? Yes, Jim, come in. All right, sir. Jim, you're about finished with the Brooks case, aren't you? Yes, I dictated my full report this morning. Good. We just received a teletype that you can go to work on. Oh, what's it about? Criminal named Ralph, alias Rip Gibson, was being transported here from the penitentiary to testify at a federal trial. Yes. He was traveling by train, had an armed guard with him. I see. While en route, he requested to go to the washroom. The guard consented. Once he was in there, Gibson smashed the washroom window and jumped off. While the train was in motion? Yes. Well, when did the guard discover this? Almost immediately. He heard the glass crash and rushed to the train platform, saw Gibson rolling down the embankment. Fired at him, believes he wounded him. But Gibson still got away. Yes. When did all this happen, sir? Several hours ago. Any trace of him since? No. The train was stopped. The searching party was organized. But Gibson must have found some means of transportation that took him out of the immediate neighborhood. Well, if the guard did wound him, and it's serious enough, he'll most likely be needing medical attention, and so... We've already notified all doctors in the escape area. Local police are cooperating, too. Oh, good. I want you to stand by, Jim. All right. As soon as we get a definite lead, we'll go to work. <laughs> Use your arm. Okay, I guess. I brought some bandage, some water. Maybe you'd like me to take care of it. Right, go ahead. I'd have been out sooner, but I had to wait till my aunt went to bed. You didn't tell her about me? No. I've got to rip your shirt sleeve. It may hurt a little. It's all right, I won't mind. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Now let me bathe it. Yeah. Sure. I've got to get the wound cleaned first. The bullet went right through, didn't it? What bullet? The one the guard fired at you. What are you talking about? I know who you are. What is this? I just heard the report on the radio. Your name is Gibson, Rip Gibson. You escaped from your guard, jumped from a moving train. He shot at Look, you. Look, I don't know what you're talking about. They gave you a description. Now, just... Lift your shoulder a little. Did your aunt hear this report? No. Did you tell anybody else? No. Please lift your shoulder. Okay. That's fine. Now I can put the bandage on. Look, Miss... Uh... Nan. Nan Carroll. Nan. Why didn't you blow a whistle? What do you mean? Why didn't you call the cops? Let them know I'm here. Doesn't matter. I want to know. I know what it's like to be caged. Huh? To not be able to get away, be free. I've spent my whole life right here. Oh. Anyone who can escape from anything, I envy. I get it. That's the best I can do with the bandage. Well, thanks. I better go now. There's some milk and cheese that I brought out. I'll bring you a real meal in the morning. Swell. Good night. Good night. Well, Mr. 
Mr. Henderson. Yes, what is it, Jim? If you've got the time, sir, I'd like to have you give a report on Ralph Gibson. Let's have it. All right. Well, two hours ago, we received word from a witness who saw a man answering to Gibson's description hop a freight train about half a mile from the point where he jumped. I see. This witness was a railroad employee. He said the train was a westbound freight. Its destination was a point about 50 miles down the line, Centerville to be exact. This was two hours ago? That's right, sir. The train should be there by now. Yes, I know. I've already contacted the yards. Some railroad detectives are going to search the train for me. Good. We have no guarantee, of course, that he didn't jump off somewhere en route. I uh, know. Excuse me. Sure. Anderson speaking. Yeah, just a minute. It's for you, Jim. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Hello. Yes. Oh, hello there. Really? Well, did you... Did you pick up any other clues? Hmm. Yeah, I see. Well, thanks a lot. All right. Goodbye. That was the Centerville Railroad Police. What did they have? A coat that they positively identified as belonging to Gibson was found in one of the freight cars. But no sign of him? No, they feel he jumped off somewhere en route. Oh, by the way, there was a bullet hole in the coat, and it was quite heavily stained with blood, so he was wounded. Uh, Jim, I suggest that you alert the local police all along that 50-mile route. Right, sir. Then arrange for a crew to cover the tracks. See if you can pick up any evidence on where he jumped off that freight. Ned? Yes, Aunt Bessie? Where have you been all morning? I, I just went out a half hour ago. Well, where did you go? I took a walk. Well, what were you doing in the barn? The barn? I just saw you coming out of there. I was putting away some tools. Oh. I think I'll go Wait a minute. What? That plate in your hand, that's my best china. What were you doing with it? I just picked it up. You had it in your hand when you came in. Well, if you must know, I used it to feed the chickens. My best china? I'm sorry, Aunt Beth. Wait. Huh? What's that all over your apron? Where? Right there. Looks like blood. Oh, it is blood. I cut my finger. Let me see it. Please, Aunt Bessie, leave me alone. Now, just a minute, young lady. But there's no point in making a fuss over just a little cut. I I'm going to go upstairs and fix it right now. Rip. Back here. Oh, you were able to move. Yeah. I thought you weren't coming back till later. Something's happened. What? It's my aunt. She knows I'm here? No, but she saw me come from the barn before, and she saw the plate and some blood stains on my apron. Uh, I didn't know how to handle it. That's why I came here. What should I do? Let me think. I won't let her come into the barn. I promise you that. Uh -huh. Even if she wants wait to... Wait a minute, I'm wait not... a minute. Tell me something about her, will you? What? She got a car? Yes. Is it around here now? Yes. How's she fixed? I don't know what you mean. Has she got dough, money? Well, she has a bank account, yes. Oh. How much are you keeping it? I don't know for sure. Well, about how much? Well, the last time she gave me her bank book to take into town, there was $800. Eight, huh? That ain't too bad. Why do you want to know all this? Well... I'll tell you, honey. I feel sorry for you. Real sorry, see? A kid like you should get a chance to live big. Yes? I'm going to give you that chance. How? By taking you away from here. Oh. Well, of course, we're going to need some cash and a car. That we've got to get from your aunt. Oh, she'd never help us. I'm sure she wouldn't. Honey, she won't have much to say about it. Huh? We're taking. Oh, I, I I couldn't do that. Look, you told me last night you've been spending your whole life in a cage. This is your chance, baby, your chance to bust out. I know, I know. If you don't take it, you'll spend the rest of your life in this trap. You can sit here watching trains. Wait. Huh? Look out the window. My aunt's coming. Come in here. Yes. I'll stall her. Keep her out. Hold it. But she's... Let her come in. What? Let her come in. I'll let her find out what it feels like to be caged. <laughs> Tonight's
tonight's case from the official FBI files will be reopened in just a moment. Home, where Claire and I have lived together all these happy years. Where Sonny took his first steps. The place in all the world we love the best. If that's the way you feel about your home, then it's time you knew about the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. It's a money saver, it's a home saver. It's America's finest plan for home ownership. A money saver, you say? That's right. Just listen to these four advantages of the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. First, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Second, mortgage interest is only 4%, and there is a liberal allowance to help cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. Third, during the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan, ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. Fourth, as your mortgage shrinks, the cash fund increases. You can use it to pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in approximately 14 years. Well, that sounds good to me, paying off my mortgage in 14 years with that cash fund. Yes, you might be very glad by then to get rid of further payments. All in all, a man is mighty lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. Well, how can I find out if I qualify, Mr. Keating? Ask your Equitable Society representative. Get full information on the plan that protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. Look in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Fugitive Traveler. Tonight's case in the files of your FBI points up two important morals. Important because they concern you. The first is that wherever you are, however hidden your shelter may be, the crime wave in this country is your problem because it is a wave that may wash up on your shore at any time. The second moral, and one which your FBI cannot impress upon you too strongly, is that you, the decent citizen, should have nothing whatever to do with any criminal. You do not help him by condoning his crime. Instead, you only endanger yourself and become an accessory to his crime. When you come in contact with a criminal, your duty is clear. You should do one thing and one thing only. Notify your local police. <laughs> Tonight's file continues at the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is just reporting to the agent in charge. Oh, Mr. Henderson. Yes, Jim. Sending out that crew to cover the railroad tracks has brought results. Really? What happened? They're pretty certain they've located the exact spot where Gibson left the freight train. Good. It's about 25 miles east of Centerville, near a community called Ridgewood. Well, I know Ridgewood. I have a good sheriff up there. His name's uh, uh, Morgan. Yes, that's right, sir. I just talked to him. Oh, fine. The track crew called him in on the case as soon as they established where Gibson had jumped. He's taking over right now. I think you better get right down there, Jim. All right, sir. Get Morgan to work with you. I'm sure he'll be helpful. Good. I'll let you have a report, sir, as soon as anything breaks. Nan? Yes? How's your aunt? I just brought her some soup. You didn't untie it? No. She was awful mad at me. Look, she's lucky we brought her in the house. She could still be tied up in that barn. How do you feel? Yeah, I'm okay. Did the walk in from the barn tire you? No, no, I'm doing fine. Rick? Hmm? When do we leave here? Just figuring that now. Look, what about this bank account? My aunt? Yeah. What is it? Savings or checking? She writes checks. Would the bank take your signature? Oh, no. we got to get her to sign one. Rip, I wish we could just leave here and forget about the money. Are you kidding? You wouldn't get as far as that next corner. Well, she'll never sign a check for you. I know she won't. Where's the checkbook? Over there in her sewing basket. Bring it here. 
I'll get it aside. Sheriff Morgan? That's right. Hello, I'm Jim Taylor. Oh, how do you do, Jim? Glad to know you. Any word on Gibson, sir? Nothing yet, I'm afraid. We have a number of searching parties out looking for him. I see. Our bad break was that it rained last night. How do you mean? Well, as you know, Gibson's presence in this territory was established by that railroad crew who found bloodstains leading down that embankment. Yes. When I got out there, I picked up Gibson's trail. I followed it to a stream about 100 yards away. It's a shallow stream. Gibson waded into it. Obviously, to avoid detection. Right. Just at that point, the rain started. Hmm. We worked both sides of the stream up and down for several miles, but we weren't able to find any trace of where he came out. The rain, of course, had washed it away. Oh, I see. Oh, Sheriff, could you determine if he was bleeding much? I think he lost quite a good deal of blood. Hmm. Well, then he couldn't have gotten very far. I know. I've set up a house-to-house search for him. Oh, I'd like to join you in that, if I may. You certainly can. Did you uh, drive down here? Yes. Well, we'll divide up our assignment. I'll give you half a dozen farmhouses all on one roll. Okay. You'll have no trouble finding it. Fine. Let's have that list, and I'll get started. Well, she signed a check. But was there any trouble? Of course not. She was very happy to do it. That's not true. You, you didn't hurt her. I didn't have to. What time is it? Almost one o'clock. This bank stay open till three? I think so. All right. You better get into town and cash us. How much is it for? Five hundred. Dollars? What else? Keep going. Rip, I don't think they'd give me that much money. Look, look. You've got a check here with your aunt's signature on it. Tell them that she sent you in for the dough. Tell them she needs it to, uh, oh, to take a trip. Yes, but I... They know you at the bank, don't they? Yes. All right, then get it. Rip. Get rid of whoever it is. I'll hide it here. Hello. Yes? Are you Miss Carroll? That's right. My name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Yes? Here are my credentials. What do you want here? Well, I don't wish to alarm you, but we have every reason to believe there's rather a dangerous criminal at large somewhere in this vicinity. Oh, have you seen any strangers around your place in the past 24 hours? No, sir. Hmm. Well, I have the man's picture here. I'd like to have you look at it, please. All right. Now, will you try to remember him? And if you should see anyone resembling this man, get in touch with your sheriff at once. I will. I understand you live here with your aunt. That's right, but she's upstairs taking a nap. Oh, I see. Well, just pass this information on to her, too, will you? Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, uh... By the way, would you mind if I took a look around in your bar? No, go ahead. Thanks again. Goodbye, Miss Carroll. Goodbye. Rip, he was from the FBI. Yeah, I know. I heard the whole thing. He's gone to the barn. He won't find anything. I cleaned up around where I'd been. Oh. Now, look, you wait long enough for him to pull away from here. Then get into town and cash that check. <laughs> Well, Jim, how'd you make out? I didn't get a thing, Sheriff. I drew a blank, too. Look, I'll tell you what. I'll review all the calls I made and see if by any chance I missed a farmhouse. Go right? ahead. Well, my first call was a family named Pastor, a man and wife. Right. Did you have any trouble getting in? Mm, no, I... Well, uh, not usually very sociable to strangers. Uh, they were very cooperative. Good. My second call was a man named Stewart. Old Pop Stewart. <laughs> you have to shout at him, I bet. <laughs> he seemed pretty deaf. He is. My third stop was at the Carroll farmhouse. Who'd you talk to, Nan or Aunt Bessie? The girl, Nan. Her aunt was taking a nap. Probably just as well. Aunt Bessie's a man-hater. Oh? She won't have one around the place. Wait a minute. Not even a hired hand? No, sir. Hasn't been a man around there in years. Sheriff, I think we ought to go back to the Carroll place. <laughs> Right here. Oh. I stayed behind the door just in case. Well, how'd you make out? They cashed the check. Good, baby. Let's have the dough. Just a minute. Here. <laughs> okay. Small bills. That's good. 
Uh, where's the car? Out back. Right. Give me the keys. Are we leaving right now? Let's have the keys. Don't you think we should do something about my aunt first? We just can't leave her tied up. Honey, will you give me those keys? Sure. Here. I'll go get my bag. Wait. What? I've changed the schedule. What do you mean? You stay here. Oh, no. You heard me. But everything we planned, the reason I did all this was to get away. You've got to take me with you, Rip. No dice. You promised. Look, sweetheart, you're better off here. I don't want to stay here. I want to go with you. Oh. Honey, I might as well tell you right now. Going away with me was strictly a routine. What? What would I do with you? All the things you said we'd do together. The places you'd take me. The clothes I'd get. Baby, did you ever look at yourself in the mirror? What do you mean? Guys just don't go any place with an ugg like you. Oh. I'm getting out of here. No, wait. Let go. You can't leave me here. You can't. Let go, I said. No, no. Okay. <laughs> you just stay put. Hello, Gibson. Huh? You saved us the trouble of coming in for you. Uh, who are you? A special agent of the FBI. What? I was just showing the sheriff here why I came back to this farmhouse. Your footprints there in the mud. Hmm? Now I think we should arrange to put you back behind bars. Ralph Gibson was returned to prison after being given an additional 20-year sentence in a state court for his brutal assault on the elderly farm woman. And thus, another criminal was brought back after escape by your FBI and a lurkle local policeman. Another instance in which local authorities lent a very important hand to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Your FBI has stated before and wishes to repeat that it owes a great debt of gratitude to local police departments all over the nation for the cooperation it has received from those departments. And on this official broadcast, it wishes publicly to thank every local law enforcement agency in the United States. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. You say my Equitable Society representative is the man who'll tell me if I can qualify for an assured home ownership plan, Mr. Keating? That's right, Joe. And don't forget, you get a lot of good things in that plan. A mortgage that's paid in full if the owner dies. If not, a cash fund to be used in financial emergencies. And mortgage interest at only 4%. No wonder it's called America's finest plan for home ownership. So don't delay. See your Equitable representative soon. Or write to the Equitable Society, care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Curious Cameraman. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Curious Cameraman on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.
The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Do you have a mortgage on your home? The reason I ask is this. In about 14 minutes, our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society, is going to tell you about America's finest plan for home ownership. It's called the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. Don't miss this important information. It's sure to save you worry. It may save you money. Tonight's FBI file, The Curious Cameraman. When you hear that there is an army of six million people in the United States today who have engaged in criminal activity, you're likely to think of them as being all the same kind of people. But that would be a mistake, because men and women become criminals for many different reasons. Some do it out of desperation and hunger, others because of passion or revenge. But one group of criminals, however, engage in crime as a business. They are likely to be shrewd and cunning, and are the hardest to catch. This is because they plan their crimes well. And usually they all have one goal. Each one wants to commit the perfect crime. Tonight's FBI file opens in a car that is driving slowly through the factory district of a large eastern city. A man is seated behind the wheel. The girl is beside him reading a newspaper. Pete. Huh? Will we get to the track in time for the second race? I don't know. <laughs> There's a horse here called Paul's Dream. Gee, I gotta play him. It's a hunch for me. My sister used to go with a fellow named Paul. He was all the time having dreams. That sounds very scientific. What are you slowing down for? We're, uh, we're stopping here. Why? I'm going to take your picture. What? Sure. Let's get out, Ruth. Are you serious? Yes, yeah, sure. I've got my movie camera right here. Yeah, but what about the track? Don't you want to have your picture taken? Well, sure, but... All right, then just stand over there by that lamppost. Oh, <laughs> you do the silliest thing. It won't take long. Well, is it, uh, color film? No. Well, I'll fix my makeup first anyway. No, don't bother. Okay. Pete, are you taking the picture from there? Yep. With that half-finished building in the background? Uh-huh. Well, look, couldn't I stand in front of something better than that? No, just stay right where you are. Okay. Uh, you taking it now? Mm-hmm. Well, um, should I, uh, wave or something like this? Fine, honey. Well, uh, how about if, um, if I was to... Well, maybe blow kisses, huh? Great. Now I'll spin around. Uh, open my coat. Terrific. Well, Pete, I can't think of anything else. Oh, you're doing swell, honey. Just, uh, <laughs> just hold it there another few seconds. Okay. <laughs> ah, that's it. All over? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, when will they be developed, Pete? Oh, next week. I'm dying to see them. I hope they turn out good. Well, I, uh, I got some news for you, honey. Huh? You're not even in them. Will you have another drink, Marty? Uh, no, thanks. How about you, Lee? I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Ruth, what's with Pete? What's he doing? Oh, he's fixing up something in the next room. Well, what's the stall? I thought he asked us here to talk about a job. He did. Well, where's the action? Well, he just... Hiya, went... fellas. Oh, hi, uh, Pete. Hey, uh, come on in here, huh? Okay. Me too, Pete. Yeah, sure. Yeah, come go here. ahead, Ruth. Thanks. What goes in here? I want to show you guys something. Hey, what's that thing? It's a movie projector. Huh? I'm going to show you some pictures. What is this? I thought we came here to talk business. This is part of the business. 
Put out the lights, Ruthie. Oh, sure. Uh, are these the ones you took last week, Pete? The ones I'm not in? Yeah, yeah. Now, let me give you a short rundown here first. This is a job I've been casing for the last four weeks. It's a payroll job. I want you to watch it closely, fellas. All right. Yeah. Now, this first picture is an alleyway. The construction job on the right is a big factory that's being put up. I took a picture of the alley because that's where we're going to park the getaway car. You'll be driving, Lee. Okay. Now, this view is the whole building. And you see that little shack? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. That's where they handle the payroll. That line of guys there now are getting paid off. There's one guard on the job. On payday, which is Friday, that line forms at 11.30 sharp. Now, the guard starts at the shack and works down the line checking badges. I got two badges. You'll be wearing one, Marty. Huh? I'll wear the other. Oh, okay. Next Friday, we'll be at the head of that line. A whistle blows when they start paying off. Lee? Yeah? When you hear the whistle, you move the car out of the alley and start slowly down the street. Right. By that time, we'll be in the shack. You park behind that pile of bricks, that'll give us cover. By the time you're there, Marty and I will have knocked off the payroll. We'll hop out and join you in the car. Well, that's the story, boys. Oh, that sounds real good, Pete. Yeah, it'll work. How big is the payroll? Around 30000 wow. Hey. Now, I'll run it over again, fellas, so you'll remember it good. Wait, look. Huh? There I am. I'm in the picture after all. This is okay, Pete. Right at the head of the line. I told you we would be... Only two guys in the shack. I know. Well, this is it. Right. All right, you guys, come ahead. Let's go. Okay. All right, boys. Come ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Summers, sir. Badge number. Never mind that, you. This is a stick-up. Huh? Cover the Marty. Yeah, right. Give me the envelopes. Slap in this bag. Look here, you... Shut up, you. How you doing? Okay. Anybody help outside? No, not yet. Give me that bundle, too, mister. All right, here. Nearly done? Yeah. Yeah, this does it. Now, listen to me, both of you guys. Keep your trap shut until we're out of here. Do you hear me? Okay. okay. Now, let's go. What's happening here? Around this pile of bricks, Marty. Is that car there? Yeah, yeah. Good. Everything okay? Yeah, get going. Any trouble? No, it was a breeze. I'll cover the back. Okay. Here, Marty. Hold the money back there. Uh, all right. Uh, right. How much you get? The works. Uh, the payroll guy's just coming out in the Lee. street. Lee! Has... Lee, look out for that cab. He's making a left in front of you. Yeah. Well, do something. Swing your wheel. Look <laughs> out! Oh, you stupid jerk. You okay, Pete? Yeah, we got to get out of this heat. Oh, wait, fellas, my leg. Hey, look, there's a cop in the corner there. Let's blow. Don't leave me. We're all on our own. Meet back at my apartment. Pete, the cop's pulling his gun. Yeah, scatter. Oh. Wait, you guys, wait. Several miles from the scene of the stick-up, at an FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just giving a report on this daring job to a fellow agent. It looked as if they were going to get away clean until a cab accidentally cut in front of the getaway car, Dan, and the two cars crashed. The stick-up men abandoned theirs and made a run for it. Mm, this was just a block from the scene of the stick-up? That's right. And what happened then, Jim? Well, there was a policeman on the corner. He called out to the men, ordered them to halt, and when they didn't, he fired upon them. Any results? He killed one of them, and he believes that he wounded another. The second man, however, still made a getaway along with the third. Yeah. Uh, how about the money? Unfortunately, one of the two men who escaped still has it. Mm. How do we come into the case, Jim? Oh, the car that was used had out-of-state license plates. It was from Illinois. That gives us a basis to help the local authorities. Incidentally, a checkup revealed that the car had also been stolen. I see. It was the driver of the car who was killed. Well, any identification on him? I don't know, Dan. The body was taken down to the morgue. I'm going down there now to pick up his fingerprints and check over his effects. I'll contact you as soon as I return. Thank you.
Just a minute. Let me in. You alone? Yeah. Well, where's Lee and Pete? I don't know. What do you mean? What happened? Just let me sit down. Where are they, Marty? Huh. Where are they? We all scattered. We, we're all supposed to meet back here. I don't think Lee will make it. Why not? He got shot. <gasps> Bad. Last I seen of him, he was stretched out in the street. What about Pete? He got away okay. Did the job go bad? No, that worked okay. After we got the dough pulling away, we ran into a cab. Oh. Cops seen us. When we made a break, he started shooting. Help me get my coat off. Here. What's wrong with you? I got hit, too. Oh, Marty. Where? Here in the chest. Pull that sleeve. Oh, gee, you're bleeding bad, huh? Yeah, kind of. We better call a doctor or something. No, no dice. Well, look, if you... Now, just help me in the bedroom. Let me lay down a while. Sure, Marty. Here, just... Lean on me. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Yeah. What about the money? Oh, we got that okay. Has Pete got it? No, I took it. I stashed it away. I didn't want to carry it around. Oh. How'd you get here, bleeding like that? Well, it, it didn't start to get bad till just before I got here. Just let me lay down here, huh? Oh, sure. Yeah. There, there you are. Well, I'll go get some towels and stuff and fix you up. Did you go to the morgue? Yeah, I just came from there. And? The police have been working. They contacted the Illinois State Police, gave them a complete description of the man who was killed. Yeah? They seemed to think it was a man named Lee Perry. He had a long criminal record, and I got a set of his fingerprints and sent them on to the Bureau in Washington. I see. Uh, did the Illinois police have any idea who Perry's associates might be here? No, Dan, they didn't. They're checking on that now, though. Uh, how about the paymaster at the construction job? Hmm? Was he able to identify the other two holdup men? Oh, he's down at headquarters now looking over pictures. He didn't remember them very well, though, so that may not lead to anything. Hmm. Uh, was there anything found on Perry that might help? The only thing that might be important is a note. I have it here. Huh? It reads, go to Ruth's apartment on 12th Street. Pick her up and have her bring the movie projector to my place. Any signature? No, but this note is written on the back of an envelope which originally contained snapshots, see? Eh? Ah. It's from the Argosy camera shop. Oh, they're down on Spring Street. Yeah, I know, Dan. This envelope has a number on it. I'm going over to the camera shop now and see if they have any record of the name of the person these pictures were developed for. <laughs> Marty. Little boy. Blue suit. Always wears a blue suit. Marty. Don't, don't try it now. Marty. Huh? What? Don't you think I should get a doctor? Send a little boy up and down, up and down, race you to the corner. Marty, will you listen to me? You need a doctor Uh, real bad. Oh, water. Get me some water, huh? Sure, sure, Marty, sure. I'll be right back. Everybody can swim but me. All the guys. <gasps> Who is it? Pete, Pete. Oh. Oh, Pete, oh. I'm so glad to see you. Anybody get here? Yeah, Marty. Where is he? He's in the bedroom. Oh, oh he's in bad shape, Pete. He got shot, and he's bleeding real Never bad. mind that. Never mind that. Did he bring the dough? No, he didn't. What? What happened to it? He said he stashed it away. He, he didn't want to carry it around. I got to go talk to him. I'll get him a glass of water. He's been saying right along how thirsty he is, and I was just going to get him... Ruth! Yeah? What is it? Where, uh, where did Marty stash that dough? I don't know. Didn't you ask him? No. Oh, you blubberhead! Look, ask him yourself! I can't, stupid! But... He's dead. <laughs> Tonight's case from the official FBI files will be reopened in just a moment. My house is not the largest in the world, not the finest, not the most luxurious, 
but it's a good place to live in. The place I love the best. It's my home. You're the kind of man, you who think a lot of your home, that the Equitable Life Assurance Society had in mind when it created its famous Assured Home Ownership Plan. It's a money saver. It's a home saver. It's America's finest plan for home ownership. Sounds good to me so far. Let's hear more. Well, this Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan has four main advantages. First, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Second, during the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan, ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. Third, as your mortgage shrinks, the cash fund increases. You can use it to pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in approximately 14 years. Fourth, mortgage interest is only 4%. And there is a liberal allowance to help cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. You mean it? Interest only 4%? Yes, and it's a true 4% rate, because interest charges go down every month. All in all, a man is mighty lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. Well, how can I find out if I qualify, Mr. Keating? Ask your equitable society representative. Get full information on the plan that protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. Look in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Curious Cameraman. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI proves that no matter how carefully a crime is planned, there is always some unlooked-for incident that throws all previous calculations into discard. For example, the unforeseen automobile accident which resulted in the death of two of the conspirators. There was no margin for error in the master scheme, and when the accident occurred, the chain was broken and panic replaced planning. Once again, it had been proven that there is no such thing as the perfect crime. Tonight's file continues at Pete Warren's apartment. He is pacing the living room floor. The girl, Ruth, sits dejectedly on the sofa. Oh, weeks I spend on this job. Weeks. And what have I got to show for it? A great big hunk of nothing. I'm awfully sorry, Pete. Oh, look, instead of being sorry, if you just had brains enough to ask the guy where he stashed the dough, a five-year-old child would have done that. But you always tell me not to ask questions. Shut up. But you did, Pete. Shut up, I said I'm trying to think. Not having the dough ain't our only problem. What do you mean? Well, I don't know how bad off Lee was. He might be singing to the cops right now. Oh. And that ain't all. We got a stiff in the bedroom. A dead body we got to get rid of. What do we do with him? Well, let me... Think. I'm not asking you! Okay. Oh. Give me a cigarette, will you? Gee, I, I don't think I have any. Oh, wait, I'll look in Marty's jacket. Gotta figure some way to blow town. I better get a hold of some cash in a hurry. No, no cigarettes in his pocket. Nothing but this claim check. Oh, for the... What? This, here. It's a baggage check. Let me see that. Sure, here. This is from the railroad station. There's a time stamp on it. Hey. What? He checked something this afternoon. Honey. Huh? This is where he stashed the dough. <laughs> Dan, Dan, over here. Right. Did you pick up that search warrant for me? Yes, I have it right here. Well, let's go inside. Now, what's this all about, Jim? Well, I went over to the camera shop and had them check the number on that envelope for them. Go ahead, Dan. All right. The camera shop said that the films were left there by a man named Warren. 
He lives at this address. Oh, I see. Uh, we go up one flight. Okay. I arrived here, but there was no answer at Warren's apartment. The superintendent gave me a key. So I've been waiting for you with that warrant. Well, do you think Warren was one of the stick-up men? Well, according to the superintendent, he answers to the general description. Uh, it's this apartment right over here. Okay. Camera people said he was a regular customer, that they did an awful lot of work for him. I see. Here we are. Go ahead, then. Thanks. Well, let's take a look around, huh? Right. Well, look here. What? This movie projector. Imagine it's the one that was mentioned in the note, and there's a whole stack of movie film here, too. Jim. I... Look huh? at this. What is it? Jacket. Pretty well soaked with blood. Hmm. And there appears to be a bullet hole in it, too. Dan, looks like this was a good lead. Let's search the rest of the rooms. Okay. Try this one first, huh? This appears to be the... Look, Dan. Yes, I see him. Even from here, I'd say he was dead. Hmm. Do you think this is Warren? No. No, he looks nothing like the description. This must be the one who was wounded. Dan, we'd better call the police at once. Right. And uh, suppose you wait here for them. I doubt that the money is here, but they can search for it. Okay, Jim. I'm going to take these rolls of film back to the office. I want to see what's so important about them that they needed a projector. Yes, come in. Well, how are the movies going, Jim? Oh, Dan, you're just in time. Uh, snap that light off, will you? Sure. This is the reel I want you to see. Okay. Now, these pictures are where the stick-up took place. Oh. You mean this is the way they cased the job? Evidently, yes. See, that's the construction job there. Pretty clever of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, uh, yeah. there was no trace of the money at the apartment. I didn't think there would be. One of the men from Homicide identified the body. Oh? A man named Marty Stone. He'd been involved in another holdup several years ago. I see. Uh, is that all there is to this, Jim? The scene of the crime? No, there's something coming up right now that should be very helpful. Um, here it is. Oh, that girl? Uh, opening up her coat? That's it. She has to be a friend of Warren's, Dan, so I'm having a blow-up made of her. There might be something she's wearing that'll give us a lead on where to pick her up, and if we find her, we might find Warren. <laughs> Okay. You, you got the money, huh? Yeah, yeah. I thought you said it was in a canvas bag. It was. Well, where'd you get that suitcase? I bought it in a luggage shop. The canvas bag was a dead giveaway. Oh. So let's get going. Where? To get some tickets. We're blowing out of here, honey. Now? Right now. Oh, Pete, we can't. Huh? Why not? I gotta go back to my apartment and pack. Oh, no good. But I haven't any clothes. I'll buy you some new ones. Look. There's a mink coat there, and I'm not leaving it. Honey, we can't take a, a chance. A mink coat's a mink coat. You can buy the tickets, take me home, then we'll get a train. What's happening, Jim? I just got the enlargements on that girl. Here they are. They lead to anything? Yes, I found out that she's the one who was mentioned in that note. Ruth? That's right. Look, she has a lapel pin there. R-U-T-H, see it? Oh, uh, yes. I found something else here, too, but I'm a little puzzled by it. Oh, what is it? Well, as you can see, she's holding her coat open. How many times, you know, women have their name written on the inside lining? Well, there is something on the lining. Yes, but it isn't writing. It's a couple of bars of music. Let me look at it. Here, take this magnifying glass. Help okay. Me. Dan, can you read music? Yeah. Well, is there any melody there? Yeah. Uh, it goes... Da, da, da... Da, 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 da. That's the melody. Sounds familiar. Hum it again, huh? Da, 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 da. Hey, wait a minute. That's an old song called Sweet Lorraine. That's right. Dan, her last name could be Lorraine, and that note said she lived on 12th Street. Come on, let's get busy. Aren't you finished packing yet? These are the last things. 
there. That's all. Well, close that bag and let's get out of here. Okay. Now, come on, come Wait on. Wait a minute. Oh, what now? My coat. I almost forgot my coat. Well, honey, hurry it up, will you? Okay. What time does the train leave? In a half an hour. Oh, there. Now I'm ready. Good, good. I forgot to ask. Where are we going? West. Where west? California. Oh, wonderful. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. Just a minute. Huh? Huh? Are you Ruth Lorraine? Yeah. Why? Well, then you must be Pete Warren. Who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. Oh. Look out, Jim! Oh. oh! Now, when he comes to, miss, we'd like to talk to you both about some pictures. <laughs> Pete Warren was convicted in a federal court for violation of the National Motor Vehicle Theft Act and sentenced to serve a five-year term. He was then turned over to the local authorities for prosecution on robbery charges. The conviction of the two criminals in tonight's case makes you stop and wonder why two such people never learned the futility of crime for profit. That such a career is futile is proven again by the fact that prisons all over the nation are full to the point of being overcrowded. And yet criminals will not learn. They continue to try to commit that perfect crime. But they will not succeed so long as there are law enforcement agencies on the job. Law enforcement agencies like your FBI. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Mr. Keating, the more I think about that assured home ownership plan, the more interested I am to find out if I qualify. You're right, Ed, because look what you get in one package from the Equitable Society. A mortgage that's paid in full if the owner dies. If not, a cash fund to be used in financial emergencies. And mortgage interest at only 4%. No wonder it's called America's finest plan for home ownership. So don't delay. See your equitable representative soon. Or write to the Equitable Society care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Horoscope Homicide. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Jim Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Horoscope Homicide on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Did you ever hear of a mortgage that cancels itself if the owner dies? That's the kind of modern mortgage that thousands of American homeowners now have. They've taken advantage of the Equitable Society's assured home ownership plan. 
So if you own your own home, be sure to listen carefully to the middle commercial of this program for interesting information on America's finest plan for home ownership, offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Tonight's FBI file, The Horoscope Homicide. The basic quality of crime has not changed materially in the last hundred years. In 1847, men were committing murders and robbing other men and doing the very same things that criminals do today. And crimes were committed a century ago for the very same reasons they're committed today. For revenge or lust or greed. But there is one big difference in the crime picture today. And that is that law enforcement has progressed to the point of being not a business, but a science. In the old days, if the constable of a town did not apprehend the criminal before he fled, the criminal was safe. But today, there is a vast network of law enforcement agencies that makes every career of crime unprofitable. That network begins with your local police and ends with your FBI, the last line of your defense. Tonight's FBI file opens in a small, dimly lighted room. Bruce Holden, a slightly studious-looking man, is seated in one corner of this room, busily writing. A companion nervously paces the floor. Bruce. Uh, yes, Wally? You got a cigarette? Uh, there's some in my jacket there. Help yourself. Oh, okay. You want one? Uh, no, thank you. Bruce, uh... Does this bother you? What? Uh, am I talking like this while you're working? No, no, not at all. Hey, mind if maybe I watch a while? No, no, go right ahead. Not that I'd understand any of it. Astrology is really quite simple. Uh, not the way you work it. What do you mean? All them charts and things. Well, they just look complicated, Wally. Actually, when you understand what the position of the stars mean what relation they have to the individual, then it's not involved at all. Uh, to me, it is. If I want to know what my fortune's going to be, I'll invest a penny and get my correct weight besides. <laughs> You'd be wasting a penny. Why? This is a very exact science. Now, look here. Yeah? Now, here you see the planets as they are at the present time. Mm. The accompanying graph is their relationship to me. Now, this is determined, of course, by the year and day of my birth. Uh-huh. I've been working on this chart for a very specific reason. Trying to determine what the immediate future holds in store for me. Well, how are you doing? Oh, fine. Well, what'd you find out? This coming Wednesday will be a most favorable day for us to break out of this jail. <laughs> Two days later, in a large city some 50 miles away from the jail holding the two astrology-minded criminals, FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor is just entering the office of his agent in charge. Well, Mr. Houston. Yes, Jim. May I see you for a minute, please? Yes, come in. Thank you. What's on your mind? Well, I was going down to the Elton County Jail this afternoon to interview a man named Walter Middleton. Middleton? Yes, the local police picked him up down there. But we have a detainer on him. He was involved in the Williams extortion case. Oh, yes. And we never recovered the money he collected. That's right, sir. That's what I was going down to question him about. Why do you say was going down? Well, I received a call from the warden of the jail about 20 minutes ago. Middleton and another convict just escaped. Oh. How did that happen? Well, the two men were cellmates. They complained of feeling ill, so they were given permission to see the prison doctor. Yes? Once they were in the doctor's office, they overpowered him. He used his keys to get out, and what's more, they even stole his car. I see. When did this break occur? Oh, uh, just about one hour ago. Any trace of them yet? Well, the warden hadn't received any word when I spoke to him. Local and state police have been alerted, I imagine. Yes, sir, they have. We have an interest in finding Middleton, too. Send out an alarm on our teletype, Jim. I've already done that, sir. Good. Let me know as soon as something breaks. Relax.
Relax, Wally. Uh Uh-huh. Relax and enjoy the scenery. Are you kidding? Look, as long as we stay on these back roads, we're perfectly safe. Believe me, nothing can happen to us. Uh, I know, I know. It says so in the stars. Exactly. Look, Bruce, I don't want to put the whammy in your astrology deal, but I'd feel a lot safer if we were holed up someplace right now. We will be shortly. You mean if your mother done like you told her? I'm certain she has. Uh, when did you give her the word? Last week, when she came to visit me. W- what'd you tell her? That she should find a cabin in some isolated spot. Uh, how do you know she got it? Wally, I told you. She sent me a note describing the place. Said she'd wait there for company. Uh, company meaning us. Oh. Uh, how far is it from here? About another 30 miles. What's the name of the place? Uh, Center Falls. I never heard of it. It's about 10 miles from Quincy. Oh. Uh, you know Quincy, don't you? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I seem to recall your telling me that you hid that extortion money somewhere near there. That's right. Uh, how much was that, by the way? Uh, 20 grand. Quite a sum. Oh, what good does it do me? I can't pick it up while the heat's on me. Say, I just thought of something. What? Perhaps my mother could help you out. How? Oh. Just tell her where the money is. Uh, let her pick it up. Oh, I couldn't have anybody's mother do a job like that. Uh, mine is quite exceptional. Just wait and see. Hey. What are you turning here for? I see a car parked down on the road there. There's no one in it. So? This doctor's car is pretty hot by now. I think we should work out an exchange. Special Agent Taylor. Hello there. This is Sergeant Burbank, State Police. Oh, hello, Sergeant. I worked with you last year on the Collins case. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember you very well. Oh, what's on your mind, Sergeant? Well, I understand that you fellows are interested in this uh, man Middleton who escaped from the county jail. Yes. Yes, we certainly are. We have a detainer on him. Well, we located the car that he used in the prison break. It was found on the outskirts of Quincy. Abandoned? Yes. Any sign of Middleton and the other convict? No, but a second car was stolen right near the place where they left the first one. Evidently decided to change cars and take some of the heat off. Well... Oh, Sergeant, has an alarm been sent out on the second car? Yes, it has. But they may have gotten quite a start. According to the owner, it could have been stolen any time within the last four hours. Mm Mm-hmm, I see. Well, if we come up with anything, Jim, I'll call you immediately. All right, thanks, Sergeant. Goodbye. Here we are. Oh, this is really hidden away, all right. Uh, uh, let's get out on your side. Oh, okay. Uh. What do we do with the car? Just leave it here for now. Look. Oh. <laughs> the lamp in the window. Oh. That's Mother's touch. She's such a sentimentalist. <laughs> you mean wandering boy stuff? Exactly. Uh. Who is he? It's I, Mother. Bruce. Hello, Mother. Oh, son, it's so good to see you. Come right in. Shirley, come ahead, Wally. Okay. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, Mother, this is Wally Middleton. Hello, Wally. Uh, Hi, Mrs. Holden. I've heard so much about you. You were Bruce's roommate, weren't you? Well, uh, uh, yeah. Now tell me, how did everything go? Just fine. No trouble at all? Uh, Just with the doctor. Goodness, I hope you didn't use any guns. No, uh, I just slugged them. Oh, that's much nicer. I I owe a great deal to Wally Mother. Really? If it hadn't been for his muscular skill, we'd still be cooped up in that cell. Oh, stop, will you? It was your brains that got us out of there. Don't forget the astrology. Oh? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, the stars. Now, don't get him started on that. Look, uh, sit down, both of you. I've had dinner on the stove for hours. Hey, that sounds okay. I'm real hungry. I'm sure you are. I can remember once when Bruce's father broke out of jail. The poor man was starved. Uh, 
some more pie, young man. Oh, no, thanks, Mrs. Holden. How about you, Bruce? No, Mother, I'm full. Oh, what a dinner. Uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm afraid that roast will have to go a long way, though. Why's that, Mother? Well, son, I spent practically everything I had on getting here and renting this cabin. Oh. I'm afraid one of you is going to have to do a job real soon if we're going to go on living here. Oh, wait a minute. What? Oh, I got plenty of dough. Really? Oh, how wonderful. Uh, Mother, Wally is referring to some loot from a former job. He has it hidden away over in Quincy. Oh. Well, look, didn't you say before that your mother would go get it? Yes, but I didn't know if you wanted her to. Oh, sure I do. Uh, if it's okay with her. What do you say, Mother? I'm afraid I don't quite follow you. Wally has $20,000 buried over near Quincy. Yes? Uh, I can give you the directions where it's hid. I see. Uh, how would you feel about going over tomorrow morning and getting it? Uh, where did you get this money, young man? On a job. What kind of a job? Uh, extortion. Oh, how clever. I'll get it first thing in the morning. <laughs> Busy, Mr. Houston? Uh, no, come in, Jim. Fine. I'd like to give you the latest report on that escaped convict, Middleton. Well, let's have it. Well, as you know, the state trooper called me yesterday. He reported that Middleton and his companion had stolen a second car. Yes. Well, they set up roadblocks for it, but nothing turned up all night. And they've evidently gone under somewhere in that neighborhood. It would appear that way, yes. However, it's too large an area to do any house-to-house checking. Have you gone into the background of these men, Jim, to see if they have any friends or relatives living in that vicinity? Oh, yes, sir, I have. And as far as I could learn, Middleton has no known friends or relatives near where the car was stolen. I see. I checked on the man who escaped with him. His name is Bruce Holden. Yes? He has a mother who has a criminal record herself. They've always worked very closely together. Hmm. I put a tracer out on the mother, and I found that she'd moved from the last address just a week ago. Could you learn where she's gone? Well, I talked to her landlady... She said that her daughter had brought the Holden woman a bus ticket to some place in the vicinity of where the car was stolen. That sounds like a lead, Jim. Yes, sir, I know. The landlady's daughter was out when I called. I'm going over there later and interview her. Oh. How did you make out? Just fine. Did you get the money? Of course. Good for you. Oh, it was the funniest thing. I went... Goodness, what happened to him? Hmm? Look at your friend Wally's tied up in that chair. Oh, that's right. Who did that to him? I did. Uh, where's the money, Mother? Oh, I have it right here in my shopping bag. Oh, Bruce. Yes, Mother. Why did you tie him up? Well... To begin with, Mother, according to the stars, his future was very dark indeed. Oh, poor boy. Then there was a selfish motive, too. Money. Uh, this money I have here? Yes. I see. Did you have any trouble getting to Quincy? No. I found a bus that took me right there. Well, you made very good time. Didn't I, though? Uh, son? Yes? What are you going to do with your friend here? I've just been thinking about that. I'm afraid I'm going to have to kill him. Oh, goodness. He seems like such a nice young man. I know, Mother. But $20,000 can make life very pleasant for us. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Look, Mother, I think I'll get this over with now. It may not be very pleasant. You'd better leave the room. Oh, don't mind me, son. I, I'll just stay here and count this money. Tonight's case from the official FBI files will be reopened in just a moment. Home. The place where I find rest and relaxation. Where I spend the happiest hours of my life. My own home. Yes, but there can be a sour note in Home Sweet Home when the shadow of insecurity menaces the family's peace of mind. And that's why the Equitable Society 
created its assured home ownership plan, a money-saving plan that has these four advantages. First, if the owner dies, the equitable society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Second, mortgage interest is only 4%, and there is a liberal allowance to help cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. Third, during the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan, ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. Fourth, as your mortgage shrinks, the cash fund increases. You can use it to pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in approximately 14 years. Well, suppose I don't use the cash fund for an emergency or to pay off my mortgage. It's yours. And after you've paid off your mortgage, the cash fund equals about half of the original loan. All in all, a man is mighty lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. Say, I'd like to know whether I can qualify. Ask your equitable society representative. Get full information on the plan that protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. Look in the phone book or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file... The Horoscope Homicide. Recently, in a large eastern city, a policeman apprehended two men in the act of committing an armed robbery. In the gunfight which followed, one of the criminals was severely wounded. The other made his getaway. The policeman questioned the wounded thief before he died, but he could get no information. The next day, in recounting the story, one newspaper pointed out that this was the law of the underworld, that this was honor among thieves. But tonight's case from the files of your FBI proves that there is no such thing as honor or decency or loyalty among thieves when there is something to be gained by being disloyal. There are no codes of honor among criminals for one very good reason. There are no honorable criminals. Tonight's file continues at the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is talking to the agent in charge. Mr. Houston, I think we're beginning to get someplace in that Middleton case. Good. What have you got, Jim? I told you I was going to check up on Holden's mother. That's the man who escaped with Middleton? That's right, sir. I went to the place where she last lived and interviewed her landlady's daughter. Yes? She said she bought a bus ticket for the old woman to a place called Center Falls. I see. And Center Falls is only ten miles from Quincy. Well, that sounds like she's involved, all right. Yes, I have a hunch that she's the one who set up the hideout. That's logical. I contacted the state trooper down there I've been working with and gave him a description of Holden's mother. I asked him to check with real estate men, tourist camps, and find out if she's been seen. Good. Mr. Houston, I think I should get down to Center Falls. I agree with you, Jim. Get going right away. Ruth? Uh, yes, Mother? Uh, what are you doing? Uh, working on a chart. Oh, and what do the stars have to say today? Uh, they're quite favorable, Mother. Oh, isn't that nice? They seem to indicate that a trip is in order. Good heavens, son, I wouldn't need the stars to tell us that. They seem to point to either a boat trip or the seashore. Please, let's make it the seashore. I don't like boats. Very well. That's what it will be. Oh, uh, did you finish counting the money? Yes. How much was there? Exactly 20000 Just as poor Wally said. Fine. By the way, Bruce, what are we going to do about his remains? We'll bury him. Oh, how sweet. When do you intend to leave here, son? As soon as possible. Are we going to use the car you came in? No, that's too hot. I want you to go into town and buy one. Uh, go to a used car lot. Buy one? Yes. Well, it's against my principle, but I'll do it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Oh, Sergeant. Sergeant Burbank. Yes? Yeah, I've been looking all over for you. Oh, hello there, Jim. Hi. Got a job finding you. First headquarters, headquarters to a real estate man. And he sent you here. That's right. Well, it's too bad we both didn't arrive a little sooner. Why, what do you mean? This is the hideout, all right, but two of our birds have flown. Middleton and Holden? Holden and his mother. Middleton is still here. Oh, good. Not so good, Jim. Hmm? He's dead. Oh. I just discovered the body a few minutes ago. Uh-huh. And... Is it in the cabin? No, he was buried out back. I noticed a fresh mound of earth. That's how I found him. I see. Have you searched the cabin yet? No, just gave it a quick going over. Hmm. Well, let's go in and give a look around. Huh? Surely. How was Middleton killed, Sergeant? He was stabbed. A knife was buried with him. I'm holding it for print. Uh-huh. Evidently killed by his confederate, huh? Yeah, it looks that way. Well, go ahead, Jim. Thanks. There are just two rooms here, Jim. Holden's mother rented it just a week ago. Well, let's have us a look around. Right. They couldn't have left here too long ago. I know. Uh, they didn't take the second car they stole either. That's still parked out in the... Wait a minute, Sergeant. Yeah? Well, look here. What is it? Newspaper. Dated last May 17th. And, Sergeant, if I remember correctly, May 17th was the day that Middleton's extortion victim paid him off. Really? Yes. Notice where this newspaper's folded? It could easily have been wrapped around a package of money. And if he recovered that money, then it could be the motive for his murder. You mean Holden and his mother used it for a getaway? That's right. There's something else, too, that might be a lead for it. What, Jim? It's a writing pad. I can see the indentation where something was written. That... Well, I'll get this off to our laboratory. Oh, Sergeant. Look, the FBI has no jurisdiction on this murder, but we do want to recover that extortion money, so we're still very much in this case. <laughs> Oh, Sergeant, I've been waiting for you. I have a report here from our laboratory. It's on that indented writing we found on that pad. Yes? The report states the writing was a letter that Holden had sent to a book company requesting they send some astrology books to an enclosed address. An enclosed address? Yes. That kind of stymied us. But we can contact the book company and they should be able to help us. Sergeant. Yes, Jim? The book company just called me back. Yes? They recall getting that order. It was sent to Ocean City, General Delivery. In Holden's name? That's right. I'll check General Delivery down there at once. Well, Sergeant, we've hit a stone wall. How's that, Jim? I contacted the Ocean City post office. The package was picked up yesterday. Oh, that is a tough break. Yes. Well, at least we know where they are. We can get the local police down there to help us look for them. Give them general descriptions. Wait a minute, Hilton. Sergeant. There may be a quicker way of getting them. I just remembered something. Now, who is it? It's me, son. Oh, just a minute. Come in. Oh, thank you. Oh, I had such a wonderful morning shopping. I brought some of the things home with me. I'm having all the groceries. I see. Son, are you working on one of those charts again? Yes, Mother. Don't you think you should quit for a while? After all, we're at the seashore. Mother, uh, please. Son, what's wrong? Oh, it's this chart I'm quite worried about. Why? It's right on the cusp. I I don't know if we're about to be very lucky or unlucky. Now, don't you go worrying over some little cusp. Put those papers away like a good boy and relax. Mother, I dropped... uh... Oh. oh, that must be the groceries. I'll answer it. Just a minute. Yes? Mrs. Holden? That's right. The grocery store sent me over here. Oh. Uh, well, where are the groceries? Oh, I'm not the delivery boy. I'm a special agent of the FBI. What? What's wrong, Mother? He's from the FBI. Oh, close that door. Wait on that just a minute. How did you get in here? That money you took from Middleton was extortion money. All the bills were marked. So you see, you led me here yourself. Bruce Holden was turned over to the local authorities, tried, convicted, and sentenced to be executed for the murder of Wally Middleton. His mother was prosecuted as an accomplice to the murder in the state court and was given a life sentence. And so another file was marked closed. 
because of the facilities that are available to law enforcement agencies today, like the FBI laboratory, and also because of the fact the special agents of your FBI have trained minds. Minds that remember things like the fact that the extortion money was marked. Those things are not accidents. Your FBI did not win its international reputation quickly or accidentally. It attained the status it now holds because it is made up of men who have dedicated their lives to public service, to the protection of every one of us, every minute, every hour, every day. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting story from the files of your FBI. You know, Mr. Keating, that assured home ownership plan you were telling me about sounded mighty good to me. I'm going to find out if I can qualify. I surely hope you do, Frank, because look what you get in one package from the Equitable Society. A mortgage that's paid in full if the owner dies. If not, a cash fund to be used in financial emergencies. And mortgage interest at only 4%. No wonder it's called America's finest plan for home ownership. So don't delay. See your equitable representative soon. Or write to the Equitable Society, care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Mysterious Fugitive. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Mysterious Fugitive on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.